Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us, particularly early on a Friday morning. We respect your time, so we'll make every effort to get you out of here on time as well. But uh, we're, we're looking forward to an interesting conversation today on a topic near and dear to, I assume, all our hearts because you're here and haven't won the Powerball, right? No. <laughs> I've won eight dollars. <laughs> Tina, Tina Quigley gave me a little piece of trivia before this. It was 1.6 billion, right? And yeah, yeah. you know that that's exactly the same number of orange cones we now have oh in the valley? No. <laughs> 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 uh, Please tell me she's laughing right now. <laughs> 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 All right. I'm Bill Brown with Brookings Mountain West. Again, thanks for joining us. I want to thank our colleagues in putting this event together, our folks at RTC, including Tina. Angela is here somewhere, as, and is David Swallow as well. And you, I hope you saw out front our friends from Kilios are here with their information. Please talk to them as well. And while you're all distinguished, we have some people who are slightly more distinguished. I want to acknowledge just a few <laughs> guests here today. That's right. A good host. You're all distinguished. Congressman Jim Bilbray is here right in front. Thank you. Uh, I saw Senator Mark Menendo earlier. He's here. Uh, Assemblyman Derek Armstrong is up the back there. Uh, and did I miss anybody? I know we'll have some people coming in. Oh, Deborah March is here from Henry. Excuse me. Thank you. And we'll catch up with any others that we should. Uh, I want to bring our colleague Tina Quigley up to say a few words. I just want to say thanks to uh, the fact that you've showed up today to spend some time means that you are very interested in um, learning more about this mode of, of transit and how it might apply here in Southern Nevada. There's a lot to learn about it. It's not just as simple as, as the concept of light rail. Um, and I also appreciate you being here because it seems to be that this is the first time in Southern Nevada that we've gotten as far along in a conversation about light rail than we ever have before in the past. And we appear to be a community that seems to be interested really in learning more. And in learning more, we become that much better at when we do get the opportunity to move towards implementation. But one of the things that we learn every time we do talk to, uh, to another metropolitan area that has had success in implementing a system is that you have to build community support for it. You have to get out there and educate the community as much as possible about what it is, how it works, and how it benefits the community. So um, I, I, everybody in here I, I know, and I know that you all will be, will, you'll be evangelizing. And well, as you learn, you will share it with the community. I guess that's the, the greatest um, benefit that we could have out of something like this. So I thank you for coming. And thank you for that. Yeah, our elected official leaders who are in here too. You guys are awesome about evangelizing this and, and just getting the community interested and showing support um, about what it could mean. So I thank you. I've, I've got my boss in here too. So. <laughs> thank you. Thanks, Tina. Uh, so we're going to get right to it. Uh, we're going to go through a couple PowerPoint presentations for you. Just a, a word of advice. Uh, we have a website for the event, and we'll show that to you at the end of the morning. But the website's already up. It will have the PowerPoints you're about to see, hopefully before you get back to your office or home or wherever you're going, but in the immediate future. Uh, as will the videos of, of the event today, thanks to our colleagues here at Greenspun Hall. And we're very proud tenants of this building. Our offices are right up above us on the second floor, but it's terrific to have a resource like this to call on for an event like this. Uh, I want to just uh, acknowledge our staff who've helped us with this event before and not at the end. You may have met our students, Ashley, and, uh, and out, out front as well as, yeah. yes. <laughs> uh, and our, our office manager, Chrissy Natten, couldn't be here even though she planned this whole event because with her inimitable planning skills, she brought her daughter, Olivia, into the world on January, uh, on December 31st. So <laughs> she was planning right up until the end. So, <laughs> so I'm going to bring my colleague, I've never introduced you that I can think of. I'm going to bring Rob Lang up here. Uh, Rob uh, has made a career out of studying cities, particularly southwestern Sunbelt cities. He's taught, written, researched, and you've probably 
heard him on, on more than one occasion on various issues, but uh, we couldn't have a better speaker to walk us through what cities around the country have done, are doing, and will be doing, and then take a look at Las Vegas and offer some suggestions there. Rob? Thanks, Bill. And the purpose of the first talk is to just describe what it is in a common language that we're looking to build within this valley and to cover the entire spectrum of rail so that you understand what applications of rail we don't need, where we don't need to build, what types we don't need to build. Because when we have this discussion, you know, immediately people think we're talking about you know, the BART system or something like that, and, or they think you know, commuter rail. And you know, we have these discussions where, you know, and these are thoughtful people often, that say, can we drag it all the way up to Moapa? You know, if Moapa were Provo, yes. So, you know, they say, for example, you know, how come Salt Lake City has, you know, a, an extension of its system that goes to Ogden and, and Provo? Ogden and Provo have over a half million people each. If you've got a half million people, we'll extend to you. But the, the spatial reality of Southern Nevada is that our urban form is a blob. It just fits in one discrete space. The good news for us is that we don't have to construct an, you know, a layer above light rail. We don't have to go to really to commuter rail. If we did, if we ever wanted to go to a place like Apex, say, which is gonna probably develop a, a pretty good industrial base now, it looks like it's on track. We do have the option of using a, a borrow from the freight system, you know, that they do in uh, Southern California in Metrolink. You know, we have options for, for doing commuter rail if it was absolutely necessary, but that is not the first priority. The first priority is the city making structure of either light rail or streetcars. And I want to go through the country and talk about examples of all that, starting with uh, the high speed rail. We have one true high speed rail line and it barely goes high speed through the Northeast. And I think people have been on that, they're, they're giggling. I've been on it, certainly. Uh, it takes much too long to get to New York City from Washington than it should in any other developed country in the world. You'd be whisked there, but maybe we jump all over that with the Hyperloop. Uh, we're talking long haul inner metro, long haul commuter, heavy rail systems, our light rail system, and I think we could use an overlay maybe of a streetcar system. And then there's also places with multiple systems. Uh, so what's the best choice for the valley? We're not talking about bringing rail service to the entire county. We're talking about a much tighter space that never really gets past the beltway, that never gets past the sort of urban core of the region, that maybe ends up in North Las Vegas just past the downtown in a park and ride, or ends in downtown Henderson, let's say, as the furthest reaches of the, of the system as it would go. So I want to go and spend a little time on this table to start, because this is the sort of master table that covers all of the, uh, the cities I want to touch upon, the types of rail. Uh, and you can see there's a diversity of places that have rail, from you know, east to west. Uh, certainly there's a lot built in the southwest and west recently. Uh, and you see, for example, the year service began on these. Most of these are fairly new. Uh, the oldest system is the Bay Area Rapid Transit, which was actually three, three trains were built at once. Metro in Washington, D.C., MARTA in Atlanta, and uh, BART under the Great Society programs from Lyndon Johnson. And it was a fresh start at heavy rail in three regions that had no history of it. And it's the last sort of big lift we've done in this country. LA did it on its own. LA built heavy rail on its own. It wasn't part of this program, but this was heavily subsidized by the federal government, as a matter of fact. And so that's the, the oldest one we're looking at here. The newest is the streetcar. And yes, they have a streetcar in Tucson. Tucson has beaten us in light rail, you know, actually. And usually Tucson doesn't even have a beltway. So Tucson usually doesn't beat us in anything. So, uh, you know, that's, that's interesting in itself. The other thing is, um, could yeah. Could you tell the difference between what, what streetcar is? Because a lot of times people think streetcar is a trolley or a. It is a trolley. Well, <laughs> we, I'll show you. Okay. We'll talk more about that. Yes, all this is, it's the weight of the train, the speed of the train, the distance between tracks, the segregation of the train from, from people. So a streetcar is the most intimate in that it doesn't have real stations. If you're in Portland, you notice that there is a system, Max, that goes out to the airport, and it hauls when it's 
in the flats on the way out to Portland Airport. And then in the heart of the city, in the downtown and across Burnside and over the bridge in this little tiny loop is the cute little Portland streetcar. And its stations are a pole. You know, you just walk right up to it. So the, you know, the first kinds of transportation we had when we switched from, you know, horse-drawn omnibus to, you know, a rail carried by, a, you know, pulled by a horse and then switched to trolleys were, and I'll show you this, you'll see as we go through this presentation, something where you just interfaced with. Now, steam engines and things like that carried long-haul passengers already in the mid and late 19th century. There were traction systems like cable where you had a common steam source and you put a cable out and you gripped it and you pulled yourself around San Francisco and Chicago actually had the biggest cable system. But in the modern sense, what it means is that in the late uh, 19th century, early 20th century, one of the most ubiquitous forms of urban transit were these cute little streetcars all over the place. And now they're not single cars usually, they're two cars together. Um, you know, you could have eight trains, eight cars rather, in the, in the metro system. Washington, D.C., hundreds of people are boarding uh, that kind of system. And you have to go in an escalator, down a station, through a turnstile. It's a very formal engagement. So I want to cover all those kinds of, uh, of variables, if you will. High-speed rail, look at the length of the track. Look at the Intermetro Surfliner from Santa Barbara down to San Diego, 350. The Virginia Rail Express, which brings commuters into Washington, D.C., from Fredericksburg, Virginia, from Manassas, Virginia, 90 miles. Bay Area Rapid Transit, 104 miles. Then you get 23 miles, and they're building out the edges as we speak right now, in the light rail system. And then look at this jump. 3.9 on our monorail, 3.9 on a streetcar, and the people mover in Detroit's only 2.9 miles. And oh, by the way, yeah, we have people movers as well, and I'll describe what those are. Uh, and this, this region has several people movers, as a matter of fact. The number of stations you see also varies. And you see as many as 45 stations in BART and 37 stations on the light rail. And you see less stations on our monorail. But the more important variable is the distance between stations. So if you're on high-speed rail, you want to move. You don't want to stop every quarter mile. <laughs> You don't want to stop every quarter mile on uh, metro that's going be on, on trains that are going between metropolitan areas along the coast in Southern California. A little more stops in a place like Virginia Rail Express, you're going to stop at you know, Alexandria downtown and all that sort of stuff. And then on the you know, Bay Area Rapid Transit, you start to get every couple of miles, and then boom, 0 0.6 miles, 0 0.5 miles. The smaller systems, 0.2 miles. You can practically walk between the stops and because they don't have the function of carrying you long distance. They're intended for a limited space. Look at the number of passengers. Most of these systems do not carry that many passengers, but look at BART. BART, mass transit, rapid transit, heavy rail, is carrying the most passengers. The Washington Metro, the New York City subways, SEPTA, the Southeast Philadelphia Transit Authority in Philadelphia, T in Boston. Those are the heavy trains that are carrying heavy commuter passengers. And then there's these, again, commuter rail could be a proprietary system where you're taking this many drivers off the road in the Washington Metro and, their, and the Washington region and they're happy for it. The interesting thing is, look at light rail. The numbers on light rail are impressive in Phoenix. We're talking about a lot of people that aren't entering that downtown in automobiles. We're talking about, if you look at our situation, a lot of people who wouldn't be entering our tourist corridor or the convention center on, in passenger cars and eliminating that many cars would be fantastic. And then you see less and less and you know people are already bickering about how many people are actually riding the, the Tucson streetcar uh, and we can we can discuss that later. But even the people mover in Detroit's got some riders on it. Oop, sorry me. This thing jumps around by the way. This thing, if you get nauseous, <laughs> let me know. We're testing this out. A couple of more variables here. This direct street access, meaning do you, can you interface with this thing right at street level? No, 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 no. Yes on light rail, yes on streetcars, no on monorail, <coughs> escalator, and no on people movers. You gotta go up an escalator. And then where do these travel? Most of these are surface, some are above ground, and then transit systems are often above and below ground when they're in cities like San Francisco, Washington, New York. The light rail is ground level, the monorail is above ground, a streetcar is ground level, and the people mover is above ground. What Las Vegas needs are street interfacing, ground level, light rail, and possibly a streetcar. If we built the streetcar, it would go down Maryland Parkway. And it would be a more limited system that would go through downtown, that would link the medical district. If we do light rail, that goes through the strip, that goes up to North Las Vegas, there's a commuter 
possibility because you could build a park and ride just past the downtown and pick a lot of workers up on that system. You can do that in Henderson as well. So there's a difference and a reason to build each of these systems. And there's expectations about each of them and there's benefits from each of them. What's nice about streetcars and light rail is that they're city making technology. What you really get on that streetcar in Maryland Parkway is if you look across the street from Greenspun Hall, there's parking lots. If you build something as fixed as a streetcar, as a trolley, you're going to see those parking lots fill with higher density, mixed use, multi-story structures, and the real estate value of that is one of the benefits we're looking at. Okay, let's visit the, the various systems, starting with high-speed rail. So again, this is, you know, 14 stops. It's just hauling uh, along the northeast, not nearly as fast as it should. That's the route map. And uh, the, the big stations include places like Penn Station in New York, Union Station in Washington, D.C. And you can see, you know, they try to show it looking like it's moving fast, but <laughs> believe me. <laughs> but somewhere in southern Connecticut, you can throw, you know, a rock at it and it's, you know, it's too slow to even get hit by a rock, if you will. So, uh, inter-metro, inter you know, the sort of long haul passenger rail, Pacific Surfliner is actually a very successful system. It is the equivalent of the Northeast Corridor. The, the most successful parts of the Amtrak system are the Northeast Corridor line, Washington, D.C., to, uh, to uh, Boston, and then, of course, you know, Southern California. It makes sense. The two largest scaled urban complexes in the United States are the southern part of California from San, Santa Barbara to San Diego, which has, you know, 25 million, 26, depending on how you count the, the population of the Inland Empire or not, you know, 26, 28 million people. The Northeast has about 60 million people. You know, these are the kinds of densities that in Europe or Asia, they build high capacity through, too. It's not that the U.S. lacks the densities to build. And LA is an extremely dense environment. Actually, New York, if you look at satellite imagery and you do the calculation of how many people live per net acre, and the satellites can give you these because they're looking at you know, resources and whether or not we're using too much farmland, and they calculate out through an algorithm how much people are living in relatively high density. The densest region is New York. Second is LA. Third is Las Vegas. And the reason is, is that we just were pemmed in mountains, uh, BLM, you know, go ask the Bundys. They feel hemmed in. <laughs> uh, and we're desert, and you got to put water to everybody's house, and you know, you have small lots. You might have single family homes. And the, the interesting thing is, we just don't make a lot of use of that right now. What we have is the highest density without any of the accommodation of that in terms of pedestrian orientation, in terms of city making. So we have all of the sort of built form that would imply an easy and successful conversion into some form of rail transit. But it's just we haven't had the will so far to build it. And as Tina said earlier, I think she's right. I think we're as close as we, we've gotten, and I think we're going we're gonna to go to completion on this. So this thing runs along from St. Luis Obispo, really north of Santa Barbara, to San Diego. It has this wonderful stretch, you know, by San Onofre where you're, or Carlsbad, and those nice stations where you're, you're riding along the beach. So if I had to pick one, I'd rather ride this train than the Northeast Corridor which is barrels of toxic waste in New Jersey. <laughs> barrels and barrels of toxic waste. I could say that because I went to Rutgers University and I had to take this train from New Brunswick to New York all the time. And the whole path was the history of the Industrial Revolution <laughs> from the chemical perspective. And there it is on this nice little bluff. Don't rain too hard, El Nino. You'll wash that bluff away. That's the one thing is Southern California's fragile. All right, going back to the commuter line. So VRE is this system that's, you know, people have, uh, jumped onto the freight line here and borrow the freight line so that, you know, when people say, you know, why are we running these trains? It's, you're already doing freight. So it's about, and you already have metro stations like at Old Town Alexandria. So it's an easy thing to do. You know, there's times where the thing has to go slower in the summer because the tracks heat up and everybody complains. But if you live in central Virginia and you work in Washington, this is one of the best options you can take because this system is something that avoids almost all that traffic heading into Washington from the south, which is heavily laden. So it's popular that way. And here's just two looks at the, at the track all the way past Manassas and down to Spotsylvania, past uh, Fredericksburg down. You see the little, you know, uh, P, 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 those are parking rides. It's, it's intended for commuters. The primary person entering this is leaving the car somewhere else, because, you know, and people say this about, let's just say, if we did high-speed rail to, uh, to Los Angeles. People say this all the time. Uh, I, uh, I don't want high-speed rail to Los Angeles because it only goes to Victorville. 
Well, here's a conversation I've never had in Washington. No one's ever said to me, I don't want to go from D.C. to Richmond because the thing stops at Spotsylvania. Here's why. They don't use it. People in Washington realize something. I don't ride VRE. It's for commuters. Here's the, here's the point to people who are bitching about Victorville. Hey, if you live in Las Vegas, stay off it. It isn't for you. It's a railhead in a place where people would use a park and ride. And they would come over Cajon Pass. Why can't we go over Cajon Pass? Why don't you ask Warren Buffett that? He owns it. Okay? It's for freight. And it's heavy freight because the port at LA is the busiest port in the country. And the Alameda Corridor spills out through Cajon Pass. And those, those freight trains are coming one after another. So Victorville is as close as you could get to the, you ready for this? Five plus million people living in the Inland Empire who would find it more convenient to go to that station, park their car, and not get stuck in traffic from St. Rose Parkway all the way down to the border in California on the way home. It's a park and ride system. So in the Northeast, when they have discussions about park and ride to Washington, in places like Central Virginia, in Maryland, no one has to go into the public realm and say, please don't write hateful comments in the newspapers. It's a park and ride, and they would get it. So if you were selling this to Washington and you said, Washington is a major place for tourism, and Richmond ends up having 18 million people in it, and we'd like to have access to those people through an alternate means than them being frustrated on returning on a holiday weekend and swearing never to come to Las Vegas again because they're traumatized because they need group therapy where they share stories and exchange about thinking of having, I was thinking of moving to Barstow. I was thinking of moving to Baker rather than actually coming home. You know, I turned around and started looking at real estate in Las Vegas, I think somebody told me once. So we don't have to have that conversation in Washington. You have to have it here. We have to educate people on that. All right. And uh, finally, it's just to look at some of the stations like at Alexandria. And there's an extensive park and ride throughout the whole system. All right, BART, and a lot of people have ridden this, and this is, again, sort of classic heavy rail, lots of stations, lots of stops, but mostly it's not meant like the New York City subway system. It is a commuter line, by and large, because it goes out to these far-flung areas of the uh, reaches of the Bay Area. You know, certainly now with Silicon Valley's emergence, this would have been developed in a manner different than it was in the 1960s. The problem with the MARTA system in Atlanta, the metro system, in Washington, which is being expanded out to, it's at Tyson's Corner, which is a big office area, and so on, is that we were stuck with the, the, the spatial work or the geography, the, the physical form of metros in the 1960s. And so we had to do links to airports in these places. People weren't thinking of linking up airports. But both Oakland and San Francisco Airport are now linked completely. And just a look at, uh, this is the station at, uh, at the BART system at SFO. Phoenix light rail is worth focusing in on because this is probably going to be the closest approximation to a system we do. And again, it just links urban Phoenix. It doesn't go all the way up to, you know, it doesn't go way out to the West Valley. It increasingly goes to the East Valley and they'd like to expand it. Uh, and it also uh, is a system that is on both sides of it already expanding. So it went expansion one in Mesa, it's round two in Mesa is coming. The north side of the system, I'll show you in a second on the site map, going for that as well. In here, if you just drill down on this. So if you look at uh, this part of it, 2016, this is the plans for 2032, but this is underway. One of these opens in March, I think. So you see there's a lot more Phoenix left around it, but what's in it is the downtown, this key corridor through here, the airport, all of this. Uh, you know, maybe a separate loop that, that picks up more of Tempe, and this is just a rail line, uh, map of the rail line. You see the cars each place, th those are large park and ride stations. So what is being accommodated is a lot of people, and I'll discuss this more in detail when I do the next talk, is that uh, a lot of the use of space in Phoenix now reflects a sort of concentration of assets like ballparks and airports and all that in a very discreet, relatively modest sized space that you can capture in 23 miles, and they've built a system through it and this system's got a lot of riders, and it's exceeded most of its uh, expectations. And this is the point. You wouldn't be building more of it if it didn't work. You know, people are like, I'm not really sure it works. Why are they expanding it? If something doesn't work, you don't add to it typically. And in this case, it's, in fact, all of our competitors, Salt Lake's added to it, Denver's added to it, 
Phoenix is it. We're not just behind. They're adding to theirs. We're not c catching places that have built light rail and we haven't built light rail. They're not only building light rail. They're going to stages of the system that we might not see for a generation because they have planned ahead and they have made these kinds of investments. And that's the important point here. You can't start this too soon because every other major metro and our key competitor like Orlando can say things like this. Sure, our convention center is 17 miles away from the airport, and that seems inconvenient. And yeah, the one is just a few miles away in Las Vegas. But get this, we'll beat that. We'll beat you on a trip from their airport, which you could practically see their <laughs> convention center. You could certainly see the strip. We'll beat you in our 17 miles because we built a maglev train to whisk you there. Like a, you know, a theme, your theme park ride starts at the airport now in that maglev train. And it's not a theme park ride in that it's not trivial. It, it, it's a convention killer for Las Vegas. It is going to be a determining variable in picking up conventions and they're hungry for conventions in Orlando. They have minutes at successful conventions. We do five million people plus, they do a million plus. They got all the same infrastructure, but they're not filling their hotels the way we are. And they're building the infrastructure to complete that competitive posture. So, Phoenix. And there's just some shots around the scenes. I'll, I'll do more of that when I do the talk. So we're at a crossroads. We have a monorail, 3.9 miles. It connects several of the large casinos. It never really enters the, the city. It doesn't really go through the urban spaces. And here's just a system map. Uh, we have one system on the east side that is a monorail. These are people movers, which I'll describe in a second. And they are just for the hotels. They're free. And one thing that's true of the whole system, I think you can see from this map alone, is nothing connects to anything. I mean, the can, hotels connect to the convention center. And we could complete this system and get the Mandalay Bay Convention Center and make it a convention center proprietary system, a hotel convention center complex. And that wouldn't be bad if we build the rest of the rail around it. It actually fortifies it if we do that. It takes the monorail, which was privately invested in. So when people say, I don't want to waste the money again on a streetcar or a light rail, well, we built the monorail. Was it your money? No. <laughs> it was somebody else's money. It was bondholders' money. So the bondholders, you know, you should check in with them. If they're unsatisfied, perhaps they can weigh in. But in the meantime, you haven't spent a nickel on this thing. And if you don't ride it, you know, certainly don't spend the nickel on it. And it's working. And it's got more riders than people think. And it can function still if it's part of something integrated and comprehensive. You have to capture the monorail space around it and integrate it so that you feed people into the system and then it will be better. And then these, you know, these trains on the, the west side are just convenience for people between hotels. They want to keep you in the space that MGM is dominating and keep you, uh, keep you playing and keep you shopping and so on and keep you in, in their restaurants. So it's not a true city rail the way others have developed. Uh, and uh, Tucson streetcar, again, this is, uh, Single line, began service just a couple of years ago, a year and a half ago, really, 3.9 miles. What it gets, though, is the, it's the University of Arizona's connection to the downtown. And it runs through the University of Arizona campus right down the middle of it. And it connects to the downtown and to a medical district. There's a big, you know, unlike the you know, UNLV, they got to get a big uh, hospital in the 1960s and medical complex and so on. And we're going to get ours. And ours is going to get rail. But they got theirs and they got rail to it. And they're building that asset out. So this is just a quick look at the system map again. The whole University of Arizona campus is covered. You see the downtown. And this 4th Street corridor is a fun, you know, student-led services corridor. It would be good if we had something like this or Mill Ave. Maryland Parkway could be that. So here's what's going on. Mill Ave in Phoenix now is not just a downtown in Tempe at ASU. It's also fortified by light rail access. And I'll show more of that in the second talk. The other one here is, uh, you know, uh, Tucson and, and University of Arizona. It's got rail to it. There's rail to the University of Utah. There's Here's what you can do. Why do I mention that? When I went to Rutgers University, I went with no car because it was a walkable city. And if I wanted to go to New York or Philadelphia, there was a train. If you go to ASU, you don't need a car. If you go to University of Arizona, you don't need a car. We're now competing with, with you know, schools for millennials who have a preference for this mode of transportation in the first place, and we're not offering it. We are missing students, we're, and we're having students not apply with strong resumes because we don't have this capacity. Maryland Parkway would be a lift if it were changed 
not just for the real estate investors along it, but for the university and what the university could offer the city, because this university in this city is doing $700 million a year in sponsored research. They're doing, seven, they're doing $500 million a year in sponsored research at ASU. Our entire state does $125 million. To put that in perspective, so does Fargo, North Dakota. So does Fairbanks, Alaska. So does Las Cruces, New Mexico. Not Albuquerque, which does hundreds of millions. So we really don't have this capacity. We really don't have this kind of facility. And rail is part of the game plan for getting it. And there's just some shots around. This is fourth coming around the bend back towards the school. And then finally, there is the people mover. And you need to cover this because people movers are actually ubiquitous in that most airport links to terminals from gates are actually people movers. They're not monorails because they got more than one rail. So you've been on this. Everyone here has been on it. If you haven't been on it in the hotels, if you go to McCarran and you have to go to the D gates and you go out on that stop to stop, that's actually a people mover. Now, they work wonderful in airports. I would recommend people movers for all airports. <laughs> they don't work as well in cities because they don't have the quality of the street interface. They're also you know, seen as sort of limited spaces. And if you've if you got a dying district like downtown Detroit, although there's some Bil uh, only, only the buildings that exist are shown here, I like to joke. Everything else is a vacant lot. That's not true. <laughs> These are the highlights. Anyone from Detroit? I'm sorry about that. I didn't, didn't mean to take a shot at Detroit. Couldn't help. It's morning. I'm trying to stay awake. Detroit came up. I had to take the shot. Sorry. Uh, so the Renaissance Center and their big convention centers there. They just did an auto show in this big convention center, for example. And here's just a look at the loop. It is a closed little loop. I've been to Greek Town. It's, there's two or three stops worth making and the rest is a sort of failed amusement park ride, or it's you know, missing an airport, if you will. Uh, so Detroit people were just a couple of shots of it. You see it's elevated again. And you could see this. So you know, if you go in city center, that's a people mover. Because it's not a monorail. It has more than one rail. And it's, and it's proprietary, and it's through a, a space like that. So we're at a crossroads. Let's talk. And uh, I want to finish this talk by covering just uh, you know, what do we mean by some of these uh, rail systems? And do we go above ground? Do we go below ground? And all that jazz. So this is the Las Vegas Valley. And I took a, we took a satellite image at night because you could see it's bounded, which means, as I said earlier, that this urban core right here, which is one of the most visible things from space because it represents intensity of use, urban intensity, is really the kind of most of what we're talking about using the light rail to link up. And just to let you know where we are in 2011, this is what was under construction around the country. So if you look at Portland, as I mentioned earlier, Portland has a streetcar, that's the little blue box, and has the little circle representing light rail. So they, what they do is they do multiple systems here, opening, construction started, construction's continuing. And you see it around the country. They left a couple of places off. I don't know why they thought, I guess at this point in 08, Phoenix was done. So it had been completed. But you see how busy this is around the country. And what Washington has is a metro rail, which is really the transit systems like the Bay Area I was talking about. So what's really changed in the last few years and starting in the middle of last decade is how many systems have taken this on. You see Texas cities that had no experience with it. Orlando has commuter rail and now has a maglev. Miami has trains, for example, Norfolk. And this is just 2016, so this is an update. We're here now because this one includes bus rapid transit, and we are doing BRT, and we have BRT. And BRT is nice, if especially it clears the path for where you could eventually put rail in as well. It's a nice starter system, and we should keep some BRT anyway. Uh, and you know, BRT is an alternative and uh, less expensive to light rail. It's not a city-making technology because people don't see it as a long-term investment. So they don't build multifamily housing around it, and they don't build up the, the sort of urban space around it. And just an illustration quickly, this is the difference between these. So these are people. I don't know if the lights are too bright on this thing. Maybe we can turn the lights down so we can see. We've got to see the videos better, too, later on. Uh, this is a common comparator where you see the difference between this is how many cars equals this many people. And this is if they were in transit. So if you think about the space that we have in our city and the space we have at the Consumer Electronics Show around the convention center, 
And think about how precious that space is as far as access. Every single passenger in a vehicle like that is basically taking up a lot more space than would be people packed in a train or in a bus or any other form of transit or biking, and they're biking right here. So a big question, elevated, street level. My sense is that most of the system here would be street level. We may need to drop down because we have already such urban intensity on the strip and it may prove so disruptive that we might have to switch modes and leave ground level. But the essence of a light rail, the heart of it is that it's convenient for street access. So when I was recently in December 30th, you'll see we have video from when I was recently in Phoenix, I was in such a system where you feel the intimacy of just walking right up to it. And if you've already got your passage for the day, and the trains come and you just hop right on, you can bike right on, you roll it, it's at grade even. Uh, and that's different when you look at what we have around here. So this is just a shot of city center. Perfectly fine going hotel to hotel. This is Las Vegas, New Mexico, by the way, which had a streetcar <laughs> at one point. Uh, so I'll leave it, I don't want to get way into the controversy. But if you're doing light rail, most of it's going to be grade. Most of it's going to be street grade. If you're doing a streetcar, it's certainly all street grade. It's a streetcar. That gives it away right there. It isn't a people mover, that's from the 60s. It's not, in the future, we'll all be on you know, people movers and all that sort of stuff from when I was a kid. Uh, and we've had you know, challenges going below ground in Las Vegas, just as an editorial note on that. As you see, we've had not a lot of success. <laughs> all right, I'm gonna go on to the second talk now and just stay put and I'll do Q&A at the end of it all. And because uh, I'm trying to speed through this, you all have busy lives and a busy day ahead of you, I'm sure, although it's the start of a three-day weekend. Uh, but if you could, Jennifer, load up the, uh, the next talk.